Leon Logo Theatres. Lubitsky! <laughs> How are you? Good. How are you? The only problem is I can't hear you. What? Yeah, you can. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, that's good. You can't hear me? I'm glad you can hear me. Oh, I, I can hear you now. Why couldn't you hear me before? I don't know. I'm a technically not the smartest fellow. <laughs> I, uh, Binsky. What's up? How are you? <laughs> I'm great, dude. You have my full attention. <sighs> oh, my. What? How you doing? I don't have your full attention normally. You normally do, but now you have my extra full attention. <laughs> so how <laughs> I, are you? I'm great. I'm back in, uh, in the U.S. Okay, that's so cool. Well, I mean, I wasn't expecting you, Drew Binsky. I must tell you. But I'm glad that it was you, and it is you. So uh, how many, how many uh, countries are you away from the big number? I am three countries shy of all 197. Wow, wow. Yeah. Which, uh, which of those countries? Jamaica, which I'm planning to go in May, and then Palau, which is another island country in the Pacific, planning to go there in um, July. And they just opened to vaccine people who have the vaccine. So I just got mine. So I should be good. And then in, uh, in August, I'll be in Saudi Arabia and then I'm done. That's it. What are you, you going to do with, with, with life after you've finished the 197? I'm going to morph into Leon Logothetis and follow your footsteps. <laughs> no, I'll speak more, write more books, visit more places that I want to visit. As I'll chase the story as opposed to chasing the country. So I'll just go find the coolest people and find the most interesting parts of the world and then document it. So yeah, that's, I'm looking forward to, to that freedom. So the question that I'm sure many people want to ask you, and probably many have, is what inspired you? to travel and not just to travel because many people are like oh yeah all right, all right then well, yeah. i'll travel a little bit here right but you decided to do the entire world so what inspired <laughs> you to travel I, grew, I traveled a bit as a kid like domestically and i always wanted to go to maine have you been to maine I, do you know what i haven't i'm ashamed it's just like the farthest state <laughs> on the map and so when i was a kid i would always tell my mom like i want to go to maine like i just for no reason i just wanted to so like I don't know if that means I just wanted to go somewhere like far away from the norm, uh, even though it was in, within my own country. And then I did end up going to Maine when I was in college. It was, it was pretty cool. Um, but no, studying abroad in the Czech Republic when I was 20 years old, first time overseas, just like became instantly obsessed with the experience of meeting new people, trying new foods, visiting new countries, learning new languages. It was just like I became obsessed with it when I was 20, which was, I'm turning 30 in two months. So we're talking exactly 10 years ago, this happened. And then, um, yeah, just wanted to keep traveling. So I taught English in Korea and that it was game over. As soon as I went, moved to Korea in 2013, it was game over. I knew I was going to keep traveling. And it's like, it's almost a kind of thing like, and you know this, the more you travel, the more addicted you become to the next experience. And also the more you travel, the more you realize how little you know about the next place. And so you just want to, like, I've been to 194 countries, but I haven't seen shit. I've seen nothing. So I just want, I need to like, keep going to new places. Yeah. It's an obsession. I get the obsession part of it. Um, what do you think you learned? If, if, if someone would say to you one thing that you took away from all of this travel, what would mm -hmm. it be? What I'm going to say is, what you said to me. And it's also what every traveler says the same thing, but it's because it's the truth. And it's that all people are the same. doesn't matter your bank account. doesn't matter your skin color. doesn't matter your religion. doesn't matter your beliefs, your sexual orientation. We're all really the same. And that's the core of humanity. And that's, that's the most beautiful message that I could possibly spread is that it doesn't matter if I'm in, the, in, in a slum in Nairobi or in a village in South Sudan or in the highlands of Australia or in Phoenix, Arizona, uh, we're all, we're all connected in the same ways. So that's, that's the most beautiful message I've taken away. And it's something that proves to be the, the truth. The more I meet people and the more I go places and stuff. So yeah, I'm Jewish and I, I love Muslims and Islam is like, you know, a, a, something that's really close to me because I've spent so much time in Muslim countries, but growing up, I was told Muslims are bad people. And not really bad people, but I was, I was not, I didn't have a good impression of Muslims as a kid going to Hebrew school, getting a bar mitzvah, 
hearing about 9-11, like these things like, you know, hit your brain. And then, yeah, I've spent over a year, I've spent probably a year and a half of my life in Muslim majority countries. And, you know, out of my 20 best friends right now, at least 10 of them are Muslims. And I, I love the religion. It's a very peaceful religion. So yeah, it's, it, that, and that's something I, I had to learn from, from traveling, you know. And did you, did you have one specific moment that you can share with us where you realized that we were all the same? There's so many moments that come to mind. Um, I'm trying to think of the first moment because there's a lot of recent moments. Um, let's see, the first crazy country I went to, when I say crazy, I mean dangerous countries that people would you know, think that, oh my God, why would you ever think about going there? In 2018, I went to Afghanistan for the first time. I've been twice now. Um, that was like my hundred and hundred and fifth country. Um, so I'd done all the easy ones, all of Europe, most of North America, a lot of Southeast Asia, you know, tropical Fiji paradise. And then I went to Afghanistan and then I don't know. I just, I was really scared like anyone would be, but I went into some of these villages and I made a video about this one village where we were just driving. We pick, picked up a hitchhiker in some countries, as you know, hitchhiking is very normal. Like he, in, in here, it's like, oh my God, you hitchhike, you're, you, you must be mentally, you know, why would you do that? But in other countries, they just need to get to the next place. So we picked up a guy and he took us to his village of 50 to hundred people living in the whole village. And he brought me inside and they, you know, I was really nervous. I didn't know what was going on and they fed me tea and they just like asked me all these questions. And it was just like the coolest moment of being in a village that nobody's ever heard of in the middle of Afghanistan with this family. I spent probably two hours there. Um, you know, the only, I have pictures and videos of the experience, but I can't even remember their names, but it was just such a cool moment. They told me they had never seen, they had never seen a foreigner or a white person ever. Um, some Afghans are white, you know, skin, but I mean, like, like a, like a foreigner who's from North America or from a country that was not Afghanistan. They had never met one before. And, and that, that moment really just, really sticks in my head. I was sitting in their living room uh, on the floor because you sit on, in, in Afghanistan, they don't have couches or chairs. Mostly they prefer to sit on the ground. So they put a rug and you sit on the floor and they get the tea and the bread. And it was just like, it was really cool. So I've had a lot of moments like that in other countries, but that was the first moment where I was in a very far away place, a dangerous place. Once again, dangerous place. And um, I just felt really welcomed and, and really, really safe. So that was a good one. And you say that at first you felt fear. Uh, yeah. Then at the end of this little chat, you said that it really wasn't that dangerous. So Correct. What, what's all that about? Well, a lot of places we think are dangerous because of what the news says and what we hear about the terrorist attacks and whatnot. But no, the, the media does a pretty bad job of highlighting the positivity in the world. Um, which is why I really try to focus on that. And I know you do too, which is why you're the man. Um, but uh, no, it's, uh, it's tough. Like the only truly dangerous place I've been, and I mean, like I was scared for my life was Mogadishu, Somalia. So I wouldn't go around saying, okay, Mogadishu is, is really safe and in that. But like every other, like even Kabul, Afghanistan, of course there are attacks there, but I can walk on the street feeling fine. I don't have to like look over my shoulder every second. Um, it's just another a normal, normal place. You know, kids going to school, you have shopkeepers opening up, you have street vendors um, selling incredible, delicious food. You have, you have banks, hotels, hospitals. I had to get my COVID test. I went to Afghanistan again a few months ago. So I had to get a COVID test uh, to leave the country at, at the hospital there. So it's a very normal place, um, you know, in terms of life happening. But yeah people places that we think are dangerous are often not as dangerous as you would think when you go there with your with you know and experience it and i'm sure you would agree with that yeah i mean look there are some places as you know better than most that it's a bit dodgy i mean i've never been to mogadishu but i'm sure that if i went i would uh, be yeah. a little bit scared right it's scary man it's very scary yeah in what sense was it scary i mean what happened uh what happened about two months ago, I went a year and a half ago, but two months ago, the ice cream shop that I ate in, there's a gelato shop, was bombed and like 15 people were killed. Like the same shop that I had gelato, gelato in and I have a video of it. Um, as soon as you arrive off the plane and the, to get to your hotel, there's only one hotel that, that you would stay at. It's called Peace Hotel, ironically enough. 
The way to get to Peace Hotel, it's a one mile drive, which should take two minutes to drive it, but it takes about 30 minutes because there's that many checkpoints to get from the airport to the hotel. There's a huge fortification system. I don't know what you call them. They're like sand, they're like bags of sand. They're like five meters tall and they're they're like 10,000 kilos the weight. Like it's just like so nobody can break in. And then the way to get to the hotel, you go through one checkpoint and then you drive the car like this, dog sniffing your bags huge rifle guys with guns check your car here then like go here just because there's so many attacks um and then every time we had to leave the hotel uh well first off when we got to the hotel the owner said hi nice to meet you welcome he took us down into the bunker in the basement and he had all these screens on the wall and he's like see all these red dots he had a map of the city see all these red dots that's where there's been um a terrorist attack in the last year so we want to avoid those areas and it was like all covered in red dots and i was like what and then every time we left the hotel there were we were in a blacked out windows car there was a, a pickup truck in front of us and a pickup truck behind us on the back of the pickup truck so you know it's like a square back there were four guys sitting on each corner full like bulletproof vest helmets on um, huge M- uh, AK-47. So there's eight guys total, four in, four in the back. Anytime we would stop to go to a market, to go to a landmark, to go to a beach, they would have to scout the area. So we would be, we would stay in the car. I was with my friend Lee. So me and Lee would stay in the car. They would scout everything. Like they would like literally look over a fence. They would like look in like little places and then they'd be like, okay, you have 10 minutes, go walk around uh, and then you come back in the car. Like that was how dangerous it was just because there's a terrorist organization called al-shabaab which is like al-qaeda isis they're all for me they're all the same but they 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 really active there and they're they're killing lots of people and so that that's really the one place that i would like i i didn't know if i was going to make it out alive man it's scary okay uh don't go to mogadishu people yeah don't go to mogadishu (laughs) noted what's the most dangerous place you've been do you know what i haven't really been to that many dangerous places to be honest um, I kind of try and stay away from them. Uh, maybe you should, uh, we should go together one day and you can teach me the ropes, right? Where have you been in Africa? Uh, I've been to Tanzania. I've been to, uh, South Africa, Morocco. That That's it. I mean, I feel ashamed <laughs> talking to you about my travels, right? Because normally when I speak to people about my travels, like, oh, so Leon, how many countries have you been to? I'm like a hundred. They're like, wow, a hundred countries. And then I get on a, on a on a podcast with you, and you're like, "Yeah, I've been to 194 countries," and I'm like, "Oh my god, we got to get you." I want to get you out of your comfort zone a bit. I'm talking like Syria or Libya or Chad or South Sudan or something along those nature. I was in Venezuela a couple months ago. Since I've seen you, since I've seen you, I I think I saw you a year ago. Last it was exactly a year ago. I think it was in April, 2020. Um, I, yeah, I, I was lucky. Luckily, I was able to travel for eight months from June to from June 2020 until two months ago. I've been on the road. So it, it was it was crazy, man, to, to travel nonstop during COVID. I, I think I'm one of the only people who just like did it. And it was it was special to be able to s- still meet people and have these experiences while the whole world was shut down. And it was challenging to deal with missed flights to deal with paranoia of people with COVID to deal with getting tested 50 times. I've been tested, um, dealing with all that crap. But the, on the other side, there were no lines. Like I went to the pyramids of Egypt and it was like, I was the only person at the pyramids of Egypt. And in, I went to other places like, and it was insane to be the only, only one there. And that'll never happen again. Um, and then, yeah, just to see how every country, like, has a totally different approach on how they, you know, you know view the, the pandemic. Like Tanzania, I was there for New Year's, great country, by the way. And they, they are like, yeah, there's no pandemic and, and everything's fine. And nobody was wearing masks. The president just died a few weeks ago. I don't know if you noticed that. <laughs> um, they think it was from COVID. But like you go to Ecuador, where I was a few months ago, and like they're so paranoid that not only do they wear two masks, everyone, but they will spray the money when they give you like a bill at the, at the store they will spray it with hand sanitizer. And so literally you hold like a wet bill. So I was like, how are you going to put a wet bill in your pocket? That's how paranoid they are. So it's been very interesting to see how some countries are on one end of the spectrum and some countries just are on the total opposite. Um, so I'm very thankful for the opportunity. So you're, you're clearly a seasoned traveler. Uh, I am 
a little bit of a seasoned traveler. Um, if anyone is listening to this, which I hope they are, but you never know. If, any, <laughs> if anyone is listening to this um, and they haven't really traveled, right? Mm -hmm. uh, they're probably thinking to themselves, I'm never going to leave my house, right? Right now, not because, because of COVID? Of, not just oh. because of COVID. I'm talking about because of all the, the, the you know, the, the, the talk about Venezuela, the talk about Mogadishu, all this. Oh, right, right, now, right. Clearly, you and I know that you know ninety nine point nine percent of the world is not like yeah, that. Yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah. But, but many people think that it is like that. Yeah, right. uh, maybe not Mogadishu level, but you know sure, sure, they're sure, going to sure. get yeah they're going to get mugged in London. They're going to get yeah, beaten yeah, in Paris. Right. All this yeah. kind of stuff, right? right? The people that have never travelled. So, if if you were given the job of um, getting people that have never traveled mm -hmm. to travel, getting people that are fearful of mm -hmm. traveling to travel. Mm -hmm. What would you say? How would you persuade them? Yeah. What I've, the places I've been mentioning are the extreme places. And frankly, those are the ones I like talking about the most, you know, Switzerland is awesome, but like, where's the, the adrenaline rush? I guess skiing on, you know, could, could be a different kind of adrenaline rush, but for me, it's really, I like talking about, you know, the, the tough countries, but yeah, start in your own backyard. I mean, it doesn't really matter where you're from. If you're from the U S great, you don't even need a passport and you can visit. We have every, everything we have deserts, we have mountains, we have beaches, we have forests, we have canyons, we have like, literally like you could do anything in, in the U S so you can start by going to the next state. Um, if you're from a smaller, let's say you're from, you're from Hong Kong. Okay. That's a really, really small, it's really a city, but it's a country. Well, that's debatable. <laughs> that's going to be another conversation. We'll call it a country for the purposes of this talk. Um, great. So you have China at your doorstep, but you also could get on a plane and within two hours, you could be in Vietnam. You could be in Indonesia. You could be in Philippines. You could be in Myanmar. So you don't really need to think, okay, I need to go on the other end of the world. Even Europe for, for me, I'm in Arizona right now. Europe is just as far away as the Philippines. The Philippines is a 10 hour flight from LA. London is a 10 or a 12 hour flight from here. So it's really, you don't have to think so big. And, and also, you know, Mexico is, is next door. Canada's next door. The Caribbean is, is next door. So you could really find, you know, start small and then just kind of see, you know, test the waters. As I said, at the beginning of this call, the more you travel, the more you'll want to travel. And I think that's a beautiful thing because travel makes us all wiser. So I, I encourage everybody to travel. But yeah, if if your budget is not allowing you or if you're a little bit too nervous and just start small and, and go next door, you could even go to the other part of your country. Like, I mean, state. If you're from Arizona, I'm from Phoenix, go up north. There's a lot of cool stuff up there that you probably haven't seen. So yeah, start small. Start small and end up having visited every single country in the world. I like it. <laughs> um, I like it. Um you mentioned about adrenaline junkiness. Yeah, right? for sure. So I was going to actually ask you that earlier. Um, clearly, you're an adrenaline junkie mm -hmm. because yeah. someone that that makes a commitment to visit 197 countries, including Somalia, including right. Syria, including Afghanistan, places where you're not, you know, yes, you may be welcomed by the everyday person, but there are people out there that don't want you to be there. Right? Of course. Yeah. Um, how 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 did the adrenaline junkie side of you necessarily find travel right you could have been an adre adrenaline junkie in so many other different ways but it seems to have been travel and the second part of that question is that the adrenaline junkie in you when you've reached i know we talked about this earlier but when you've reached the 197 countries i know there are other places you can visit right but it's like you've done it so how do you fix? How do you get that fix? I never use the words adrenaline junkie to explain who I am, which is interesting to, to hear that because I am, I guess. When I think of adrenaline junkie, I think of um, those Red Bull athletes that like, you know, what do you call it? Cliff jump, like 200 feet high. Like that, that's crazy adrenaline. Bungee, I bungee jumped several five times. That's adrenaline to me. I, but I, yeah, walking around the streets of Mogadishu is debatably another level of adrenaline. How did I get that? How did I put all my, how did I become that kind of adrenaline junkie? Maybe when I had a goal to visit every country, I started realizing how tough it would be and how, how I would have to put myself in these situations. And then I, I learned to like show the opposite side and break the stereotypes. And so that, that 
that's what I've been attracted to as a journalist to be to to be able to tell those stories and and it, to be able to tell those beautiful stories about humanity in Afghanistan. I have to go to Afghanistan. <laughs> you can't just like sit from home and be like, well, Afghanistan people are really cool. You have to go there. So I just kind of morphed into that role. And then I just became obsessed with it the more I've done it. Once I finished the countries, that's only the beginning. That's only step one. I'm going to go back to Afghanistan. I'm going to go back to Venezuela. I'm going to go back. And, and there's so many stories to tell within these places. And now that I've been there before, I know what to expect. I know how to, you know, I know how to film. I know how to approach people. I know what the, what the, you know, the five words of endearment are, like how to respect the people. I know what to wear. It's always that first time you go is like a little bit, don't know what to expect. But now it's, it's really nice to, when I went back to Afghanistan, I keep bringing up Afghanistan because I just love the country and it's at the top of my mind. Um, when I went back there, it was so, I just felt the, like pressure off my shoulders because I knew what was going on. And then it's a huge country. So Pakistan is another one. Like I love Pakistan. I only went for two weeks, but I, I would love the chance to go back and like meet more people and tell more stories. And so, as I said, instead of chasing the countries, I'll be chasing the story. And so I have a, I have a spreadsheet of like hundreds of stories that I've, it's, a, it's labeled by country. So India, I'll type in India and then I'll, okay, here are the five stories I know I really want to tell. And then here, you know, I'm always brainstorming more. So yeah, it's, it's a never ending. The world is so big that like here, another example is Russia, right? Unfortunately, I only went to Moscow, which is the biggest city, but it's also one city in a country that is so big. It has 11 time zones. That's how I explain Russia. So the U S has three time zones from LA to New York three, Russia has 11 time zones, 11. So it's more than three times bigger East to West than the U S so, oh my God, like I could spend a, a lot of time in Siberia and in, in Eastern Russia where they look Korean. You know, I lived in Korea and there's a lot of Russians in Korea, but they look Korean because they're neighbors of Korea. Mind blowing stuff. So that's what I'm saying. I, there's a lot of, a lot of places to go. So as you know, I speak at schools, right? Um, so I kind of make my travel purpose driven. Yeah, you were to. I don't know if you speak at schools. I'm not sure if you do. I have. Okay. Yeah. So, so what is the your speech about? And the reason why I'm asking you this question is, what is the inspiration that you try and give people based on all the experiences you've had? What experience do I want to give people? The, the, how do you when, when someone comes and listens to you speak, mm -hmm. whether it be a kid, let's say mm -hmm. kids. What do you want them to leave the auditorium feeling? Yeah. What do you want them to remember? First of all, I want to inspire them to travel. So if somebody listens to my speech or hears me talking and they say, I want to book a trip right now, that's the goal. That, that's what I want people to do. Because I know from experience that when you travel, you become wiser, you become smarter, you become more well-rounded. So I, the, my goal is to get them to travel. But I try to prove to them through experience that travel is, is safer than you think. because my parents included, like people in my circle think that the world is so dangerous. And this is what I'm trying to break. I'm trying to show them that, listen, I, I look at me, I'm a white Jewish guy with red hair. Um, so if I can go to, you know, South Sudan and have a great time, I'm not encouraging you to go to South Sudan, but I'm just saying that it's not so bad that you might think. And also I don't want, I don't want to always see people going to Paris and Rome and R London. Like those are great places, but there's so much more to be seen. So I, I want to just inspire them to book that flight um right away that that's my goal does that answer the question no absolutely i mean you're basically yeah. inspiring them to travel and through travel you're inspiring them to become better human beings yes yes and that's that's it um we do one more point on that we do live in these bubbles everybody lives in a bubble unless I think Europeans, in my experience, and you might have something to say about this, they might live in less of a bubble because they're all multilingual. Most of them are multilingual. They try, even if you just cross a border in Europe, you have a different language, you have a different ethnicity, you have a different, like everything's different. Um, but I, for me, like Americans, specifically like in LA, they live in this bubble of Hollywood or in even in like Manila, because it's where I've lived before, it's kind of separated from you have i mean you can't drive anywhere to another country you have to fly there's a bubble of the philippines and there's a bubble here and a bubble there so breaking through the bubble um this is why like europe is the only place where you have so many countries in such a small area because africa also has a, there's 55 countries in africa but africa is like 
I'm making this up maybe eight times bigger than, than Europe. So it's so hard also logistically to cross borders. It's hard in Africa. So Europe's really the only place in the world that you can just get in a car when within a few hours be in three different countries. And so that's why I think Europeans are more well-rounded in generally speaking, but yeah, breaking, breaking through the bubble is, is crucial. Everybody needs to break through their bubble. Yeah. Do you know when I, when I sign books at events, people come up to me and they say to me, some of them say to me, how on earth did you do this? How on earth did you travel around the world relying on kindness? And other people come up to me and say, oh, I know exactly how you did this. And the difference is the people that have traveled yeah, yeah, and the yeah. people that haven't traveled. Yes. Yes. hundred percent. I, I mean, it's a very, that's why it gets harder and harder to relate to, you know, friends from high school because they just never left Arizona or, you know, so it's just, they're still friends, but it's like, you you enter this like exclusive club without knowing that you enter the club, but you enter it when you travel. And the more you travel, the more you'll realize the separation between people who travel and people who don't. That's a very good point you just brought up. Um, you know, that, that brings me to another point, And that is, how do you deal? I, I, I've struggled with this. How do mm -hmm. you deal with going on an epic journey, right? Mm -hmm. Meeting the world, mm -hmm. meeting yourself, having all these yeah. Amazing experiences, some yeah. good, some bad. Yeah. And then coming back home. How, how do you deal with that? Because I don't deal with it well. I don't deal with it well. I, I just, I'm coming off eight months of travel to 20 countries, including Iraq. I haven't even talked about Iraq. I did a road trip around Baghdad, all over Mesopotamia. It was incredible. I mean, I was on the highest of highs. And then Venezuela, and then, you know, a bunch of places, Egypt, Turkey. I recently went. And then I came here. It's tough. And only you can understand it because you're going through that experience of going to these really cool places. But it's, it's nice because I, I can, when I'm here home, I can focus on things that I don't have time to focus on on the road. When I'm traveling, I only can focus on me, like making content, shooting, um, planning stories, the, act, the physical act of traveling, getting on planes, trains, automobiles. Um, but when I'm here, I can like have time to reflect and I can have time to plan and create and I'm building out my team. So personally, I'm, you know, growing, I'm figuring out how to scale my own business. And I have a team now of editors and creative minds around me that are helping me. And this is something I've been able to focus on while I'm here. So I guess when I'm here, when I'm here, I kind of lock myself inside. I don't feel the need to like even walk down the street. I mean, to get fresh air is one thing, but in terms of exploration, I just kind of tone that I'm in two minds. And, and like, and you told me this, you told me when you go, when you do something, you go full on and I'm, I'm the same. Like when I'm, when I'm going on my next trip, it's just like foot on the, on the gas and I'm doing like, I'm sleeping four hours a night and I'm just doing everything I can. And then I come here and it's just like, okay, breathe, relax, connect, you know, with, with real life a little bit. And then, so it's just like, you're just playing with two minds. It's tough. The answer to your question is it's very difficult to, to, to do this, but it has to be done because I, I can't stay on the road. I've done, I've traveled for a year without stopping five years ago. It's not easy. It's not fun. It gets really lonely and depressing. And so you have to have that balance, stability, and then go crazy and then come back here for a bit and hang out, enjoy, and then go. That's just how it is, man. It's, it's tough to answer the question. How do you, how do you deal with it? Not very well. I mean, that's the reality. Uh, you do a journey, whatever it may be from my yeah. standpoint traveling around the world on kindness and yeah. connecting with people every day. And then you come home and you've had these like peak experiences yes. and you come home and yeah. there's, you know, going to Starbucks is not a peak experience going to Starbucks. If there is one in, in Mogadishu, which I believe there isn't, there's is a not. peak experience, right? Yeah. yeah. But uh, it just, it's like, right. I don't, I, I don't know how to, I don't know how to do it. And it's, it's really, cause many issues for me personally but you can't you can't have those highs all the time yes you can't the problem with the highs is you keep on trying to get higher and higher and higher and higher right it's like these like you're talking about the adrenaline junkies right, right. People are now i was watching youtube a couple of days ago and i know that I, this happened many years ago but for me i just turned the, the youtube on and mm -hmm. I, I saw this guy who was in a jet pack in dubai right? And he flew like Superman. 
<laughs> and I was watching this and I was like, I had to get my girlfriend. I was like, come downstairs and watch this. It's a guy flying like Superman, right? Like, how do you go to the next level? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. How do you go to the next level? I mean, okay, so you've now flown like Superman. So maybe now you fly to the moon like Superman. But the problem is you push yourself. We yeah. push ourselves to such a degree as human beings and as travelers. Yeah. Right. There comes a time where maybe we push ourselves too far, right? I've done that before. I've definitely done that before. Where like you burned out? You mean? Absolutely. Yeah, of course I've burned out. But I like keeping raising the bar. I feel like we should you know, push ourselves to get to the next level. But yeah, I, it, this is a really good conversation and I've never had this conversation. Like, how do you adapt? I don't know. I, I to me, I see is like, it's overkill if you just stay on the road the whole time. And what I did is overkill. I was eight months on the road, especially during COVID where it's extra layers of stress. Um, that was, there were a lot of points on that trip where I was like, what am I doing? I got to and then I, d- I went to Istanbul for three weeks and I locked myself in the hotel and I just worked. So that was kind of my refresher. Um, but yeah, it's, I don't think, I don't think there's a problem with trying to up the bar of, of, there's always something you can do more. Like I like visiting tribes. I love visiting really indigenous communities that have not had contact with the, with the Western world. Oh man, there's like, <laughs> I could go deep in the Amazon for like a week and take a boat down a river and find a community. Like there's, that's like, that's next level. Um, I don't know if I'm there yet, but I know that there's always a next level to do. So I guess for the rest of our life, we can always try to get to the next level. Is that, is that a bad thing? It's not, but it is if we push ourselves too far and uh, you know, it doesn't work out well. I mean, for me personally, some of these journeys I've done, uh, season one of the kind of stars when mm-hmm. I went around the world mm-hmm. took nearly six months. And it, when I came back, yeah. all the adrenaline stopped. And for three yeah. months I was ill, you know? Really? So, yeah. So uh, I just had pushed myself so much, but, but yeah, I mean, maybe the end, well, that's because it was a six month trip. So maybe in the future consider, you know, go for a couple of weeks or a month. I don't know. Yeah. But, but, but I like your journey. So don't, don't change it. <laughs> all right. Random question. Yeah. Random Have you answer. ever been in a gunfight? Like someone shot at me or yes. I'm holding a gun? No, not when, you, uh, hopefully not you holding a gun. <laughs> Some, where um, you've been in a situation where you're like, oh my God, someone is shooting at me. No, I have not. But I have been in a situation where there have been bombs rattling my hotel and I could hear it that were five kilometers away. That was in Tripoli, Libya. It was an ongoing civil war. And um, one of the nights at like 9 p.m. before I went to bed, there was a freaking bomb loudly. Um, and everything's shaking and it's like, okay. I, I was told that if you do hear a bomb, don't freak out because it's far away, far away, five kilometers. That's two miles, but that's far away for them. But they did warn me, like, don't go crazy. There are bombs happening five kilometers away. Um, that's the closest I've been. I've never, I heard gunshots in Yemen, but I don't know. Sometimes they said it could be a celebratory thing. Like if there's a wedding, they could shoot in the air. I don't know if it was a wedding or if it was, I don't know. But I did hear gunshots in Yemen. Um, other than that, I don't think I've, knock on wood, I don't think I've experienced gunfire. So so hold on, hold on. When you arrive at the hotel, the receptionist says, uh, hello, Mr. Binsky. Thank you so much for staying in the hotel. Just so you know, there may be some bombs going off, but don't worry too much. They're five kilometers away. The hotel didn't tell me. Uh, I was picked up by a driver who was also kind of a, a fixer, a, a tour, local tour guide. And he told me, this, the first thing he told me is, listen, there's a civil war happening. Inside the city is safe, which it really is not because when I left, there was an attack inside the city where I was, where I was staying. But he said, there are bombs that go off you know, from time to time. And if you hear it, then don't freak out. They're not targeted at you. Of course he said that. He's not going to say, oh, you're being targeted for a bomb, you know, but he just, he wanted to tell me in advance because if I heard it and I, I have a video on YouTube, it's like where I'm in my hotel room, like freaking out, like sweating bullets. Like, what, what do I do? Like, I just heard a bomb. Um, yeah. So that was, that was pretty scary. Well, I, I've never, I've never had a bomb experience. I was actually. I also heard, sorry. I also heard bombs in Syria. I did hear bombs in Syria. I, I hiked in Aleppo. I hiked to the top of the citadel, which is Aleppo is like mostly destroyed now. But in the distance, I definitely I remember sitting up there, and I was with Syrian people, and they were just like, "Dude, that's like 
the sound of a bomb is like the sound of a horn, a honking horn. Seriously, that's what they told me. So the, yeah, but I, I heard bombs in Syria too. Go on. Mm. Do you remember what you were saying? Um, I can't remember what I was saying now. Um, probably not something that inspiring. Um, <laughs> Help me, Obi Wan. Say again. Help me, Obi Wan. Help you, Obi Wan. Is that a picture of you in the on the TV on your kindness it, bike? It is. It is. It's me uh, on the kindness diaries. The bike. Where, where was that picture taken? Screenshot. Italy. Italy. Yeah. Out of all the places you've been on that bike, what's the one place that you you had the most surreal experience? The most memorable. I mean, look, the most memorable experience on the bike was definitely my experience with Tony, the homeless. Yeah, guy. yeah, yeah. I saw that. Uh, yeah, yeah, I saw it. I mean, for those of for the people that don't know, you know, I ended up meeting this homeless man and sleeping on the streets with him. Uh, and then me and the crew gave him and uh, put him up in an apartment and sent him back mm -hmm. to school. Mm -hmm. So uh, these kind of moments, these kind of human moments of humanity. W what are some of the moments of humanity that you've experienced? Because having seen far more than I have really for me, traveling is about connecting is about mm -hmm. that human moment. Mm -hmm. But what's like a moment that you've had that kind of enabled you to, to experience your humanity and their humanity. Oh mm, my God. So many moments come to mind. So hard to pinpoint. Um, in India, I went to the, the biggest slum. It's called Duravi. It's actually where the, the setting for Slumdog Millionaire, if you've ever seen that movie, it yeah. takes place in Duravi. It's in Mumbai. There's, there's a million people living within one square mile. A million people. It's like, you know, and then on that, there's another fact that I always tell people there's one bathroom, there's one toilet for every 33,000 people in Duravi. So that's just to put it in perspective. So I went there in 2015, kind of before I started making videos and everything. I was a little intimidated, um, but I met a local guy there who lived there and he took me around. And wh I don't, what I realized was like, it's actually, it's, it's like, it's a mass, it's a huge business. It's a billion dollar business because they produce so much stuff. So I would go on the rooftop and I would meet this like lovely old lady who's like recycling things and reusing them for whatever. And then another lady who has a shop who's like cleaning clothes, but like, they're like little like warehouse factories on the on the rooftops of all these places. But when you go up there and like you're in this slum, so you think, oh my God, they're they're very poor. But poor doesn't mean dangerous, by the way. That's a, another misconception. Poor it actually is kind of the opposite. So you go up there, and so I'm all like a little bit scared. And then they're like, Oh, welcome. Like, how are you? Like, here's my business, you know, here's my rooftop. You know, this is what I do every day. This is how much money I make. And and once you once you enter that little circle, you just like feel so relieved. Walking on the streets it's a little, it's a lot of attention. So it's a lot of like, okay, I'm not feeling so comfortable, but yeah, just, just that, that moment of humanity where it's like, okay, I'm in, you know, the world's biggest slum and I'm here with, with a local person who's really welcoming me, welcoming me inside their house and they're showing me a good time. And I remember I, I had to pee, you know, up, up there. And I was with a, a, a guy who owns, he, he's, He's on like the top level of his apartment. I've never told this story before. I had to pee and he was like, um, I was like, where can I go? And he's like, well, we don't have a bathroom. But, you know, he pointed over there, like in the corner and he was like, use that. So it was like a, it was like a white tube about a water bottle length. Right. And it was just like in the, cr in, in the crack of, of the roof and it went straight down. So there's hundreds, if not thousands of people living in this building below. And I really had to pee. So like, where am I going to pee? There's no toilet inside. And he's like, that's where I pee. And I just felt like I was peeing on, like, uh, on top of people. But I guess it was going, I don't know the, the details behind where it went, but I, it was going somewhere and it went outside. But yeah, it's just like those little moments that you just don't forget. Um, and, and listen, like they're happy people. They, you know, they don't need much to, to live a happy life. And, and um, I know I, I took this story, I took your question and I kind of flipped it and I told a bigger story, but yeah, this is just one moment of humanity that I just like shared with some people in this place that I didn't feel safe at the beginning. And, and that's it. And, and one more quick note in the Arab world, I find them to be the most hospitable in terms of like going over the top 
to offer you free food, to show you a good time. When I was in Karbala in Iraq three months ago, Karbala is the Mecca for Shia Islam. Um, every year, like 20 million people make a pilgrimage to Karbala. It's a huge thing. And I went to a local home last minute and they prepared this amazing food. Like there was like a blanket on the floor with like all these different side dishes. And they were like, they kept apologizing. Like, they're like, so sorry, this is last minute. Like, you know, we're, we're sorry if we can't, you know, like give you enough food. And like, we only ate like a quarter of all the food that they provided. And they were just like so genuine. And they were like insisting that we, the, the, the mother insisted that we stay on her bed and she was going to sleep on the floor. We didn't do it, of course, but she was like almost getting teary eyed. Like, we want you to stay in my bed. We'll sleep on the floor. And like, that's just something that I've never even never experienced that. And I was in Iraq um, when this happened. So I, I, if we had more time, I could tell you 15 more really good stories like that, where you're just like, you don't even know what to say. You just, you just feel the, the emotion of, of the hus- hospitality around the world. I don't know, man. I can keep talking. Just cut me off at any point. <laughs> you know what? I, I, I think that um, we have forgotten, many of us, specifically in the Western world, how to be human. Yes. Right? We have forgotten our own humanity. And what I think travel does is it reconnects us to our humanity. Yes, sir. Um, you could call travel, specifically the type of travel that you and I do, you could say we are really in search of the last human beings, right? Because in the Western world, we're lost in our phones. Not that they're not yeah. they phones there. Of course they do. But they're not as lost as we are. They're not Correct. as lost on social media. Correct. They're not as lost um, with the news. They are more pure, when you go out of the city, yes, go out of You're nailing the point. right? Yes, and that, that's what I'm addicted to. I, like experiencing life how it should be experienced and not, you know, nose deep in the phone. Yeah, that's a very, very good point. That's a very, and I typically I see like that those people tend to be happier. I, I don't want to generalize too much, but I mean, walk down Beverly Hills. And walk in those neighborhoods. I mean, you'll be seeing problem after problem after problem. Um, once again, I'm generalizing, but those we're talking about ultra wealthy people. But then you'll walk in like the streets of Islamabad or or Kabul or Caracas, and you're just like, wow, like no one's looking at their phone. They're enjoying life. They're hanging out with their friends. They're having a barbecue. Yeah, it, it's very good point. And we are in search of the last humans. That's exactly what we're doing as travelers, and that's maybe one of our biggest incentives and, and our big and one of our biggest fulfillments is is finding these experiences because they're hard to find in, in this country in the u.s i mean i i think the farther away from cities you get the more you'll find people that are really connected with that humanity and not on their phones 24 7 once again i'm generalizing of course but um yeah i mean you recently i was in uh, chiapas mexico it's the southernmost province of mexico it's the most remote province of mexico and i went into this rainforest and i found the most like, indigenous tribes there and it was like you know these guys are still like chopping down trees and like drinking the water from the branches and they're like it was just so freaking cool to to i spent 24 hours living with them and i mean that i asked him like this is six months ago. So we're, we're deep into the pandemic. And I literally asked several people in that community and they had never heard of any pandemic. This was in, this was in September. So pandemic happened in fe- like February, March, it started getting really bad. So six months after, you know, it already took over the world. These people had never even heard of any pandemic happening. So that just says something right there. You know, um, it was just, it was really cool. Really, really special. Very good point that you just made. We're in search of the last human beings. I love that. I love that. Do you know what, man? You and I could uh, chat for many, many hours. Um, and part of the reason why I wanted to make this podcast, mm-hmm. um, no research, no, uh, you know, looking at Google. Expectations. No expectations. Let's just have a chat and see where that chat goes, right? Right. And, uh, you... It's like two people just bonding and two yeah. people just connecting. And wherever we end up, we end up. And isn't that 
what happens when you have people sitting around yeah. fire, just talking, yeah, yeah. you know, and, and being. We had many, many good takeaways from this chat. It's been very, very, very useful. I feel like, if, yeah, if you did kind of plan everything that you're going to ask me, it would be a different chat. It would be more structured. It would be more, yeah, we're sitting in a classroom or something. This has just been very, very chill, very, very open-ended. And I, I, I admire you for doing this, this podcast in this, this way. I've never heard of it done like this before. So keep it up. Thank you very much, Minsky. And look, when you get back to the land of the angels, please, you know what to do. Message me and uh, let's uh, go to Tony's and eat Greek cheese. <laughs> Anything Greek with you. <laughs> All right, bro. Thank you so much. Logothetis. Take it easy, Leon. Bye. Bye. Hello, everyone. It's Leon here, a.k.a. The Kindness Guy. If you like my videos, which I hope you do, don't forget to press the subscribe button and also to ring the little bell so that the notifications notify you that I have a new video out in the world.